Ana Cecilia González, and I'm the chair of the Spanish Committee for Spiritual Awakenings International. And I, I'm also part of the advisory board and an affiliated group leader. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you to this amazing NDE and SDE experience panel. And I'm gonna start with our first speaker today, which is Dr. Louise Livingstone. She has a PhD in education, specializing in transformative learning and MSc holistic science. She is founder of the Heart Science Research Institute. And as part of uh, an HD PhD research, Louise is also a co-director of Center Myths, Cosmetology and the Sacred and in addition works in the scientific medical network. So welcome, Louise. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Anna. It's lovely to be here and lovely to be with uh, here with so many of you. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen now. Welcome uh, to this talk, which I've titled uh, My Speaking Heart. Um, and as Anna says, um, I gained my doctorate from Canterbury Christchurch University in 2019. I was based in the Faculty of Education uh, and my thesis title was uh, How Can the Thought of the Heart Offer Effective Ways of Engaging with Conflict? An Imaginal and Reflexive Study. So my work, my research has been inspired by a lifetime of cardiac illness, numerous near-death experiences, and a revelatory, numinous experience that I had with my heart in the mid 2000s, which was during a lengthy episode of cardiac arrhythmias, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. So in short, I really now know that throughout my life, my heart was continually speaking to me, trying to capture my, my attention through these experiences. And so all these experiences led me on a journey to explore uh, the possibility, if you will, of bringing conflicting dimensions of myself together as part of a transformational journey that I undertook through the guidance I now understand of my own heart. And so in the case of my research and my work, my heart both physically and symbolically uh, has been the uniting principle. So um, discourses that have really influenced me as my research was transdisciplinary are conflict resolution, transformative learning, depth psychology, religious philosophy, esoteric philosophy, cultural history, holistic science, to name but a few. Um, but I'd just like to give you just a quick overview of my journey with my heart. So in 1990, I had viral myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and as a result of that, I experienced numerous near-death experiences. I was left with a pacemaker on heavy doses of medication. Uh, and a decade later, I had complications, severe complications in the form of um, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and as I was losing faith in my heart's ability to keep me alive, my heart spoke to me during a moment of deep trauma. And I'll go into a little bit more depth about that as well shortly. But in terms of context, what I wanted to really speak about in this talk today is that while we may know that the biological heart uh, is central to human survival, when my heart began speaking and communicating with me over 40 years ago through physical symptoms and my near-death experiences and many years later in perceptible words, it really became necessary for me to revisit my own understanding of what the heart actually is. And so um, I think as Lawrence mentioned earlier, it's the narrow framework that I think I was um, educated in that sort of prevented me from understanding what was happening to me. But through these experiences and me trusting my heart, my heart actually became my guide and my teacher, leading me towards an understanding, uh, particularly as understood through Sufi mystic teachings, that the heart is a place of uh, perception. It's the seat of the imagination. It's a spiritual organ, a place of knowledge and transformation that receives the world as it speaks in images, deep inner knowing, synchronicity, dream visions, and so forth. And it makes sense because certainly until only recently, the heart, as probably we all know, was considered an organ of great wisdom and intellect, 
and central to an individual's successful navigation of life in all of its complexity and mystery. So in terms of my near-death experiences, my personal experience, um, I really wanted to sort of get across this idea that my heart was speaking to me uh, from, from a very young age. So um, when I was about seven or eight, I would experience debilitating chest pain, a bit like a sprained muscle that necessitated numerous visits to my GP. Um, and no pathophysiological cause could ever be found. And in 1990, when I was 18, I contracted a viral myocarditis and I spent three months in the cardiac care unit, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, during which time I experienced three cardiac arrests. Um, and I didn't have a framework at the time to consider the implications of these NDEs. But I do recall a sense of deep peace and being welcomed into a kind of velvety darkness. Um, the memories of these experiences still lives on deep within me and while I originally believed that there was nothing after death because of the silence and peace and the darkness that was a particular feature of my own NDEs, following my experience of being guided by my heart and having um, my heart speak to me through my work and my research, I've come to understand that this was a particular framework of knowing that I had applied to the experience at the time. And so prior to leaving hospital uh, back in 1990, I was fitted with a pacemaker, um, told I would have to take strong heart rhythm medication for the rest of my life. But after being discharged from hospital, I made uh, what my consultant said was a miraculous recovery. So that in the mid 1990s, I was deemed fit enough to have the pacemaker battery removed and I was able to stop almost all medication. However, about 10 years later, and this is about 15 years ago now, uh, during a particularly stressful time in my life, I began to experience a condition called atrial fibrillation, which is a fast and irregular heartbeat. And once, twice, even three times a week, I'd have to go to the A&E department in my local hospital. And on each visit, no physical cause could be found. But these events, they had devastating effects upon me and I was unable to work as a result of these debilitating physical symptoms. And I developed anxiety, depression, agoraphobia, as I slowly lost faith in my heart's ability to keep me healthy and alive. And so I became obsessed listening to every single heartbeat, convinced that if I didn't keep a watch over my heart, that it would stop and that I would die. So I was in a, a sort of place of deep, deep trauma. So something that I call that night, and that will become uh, clear as I speak about this slide, but um, in the mid 2000s, in this state of severe anxiety, it was deep, deep in the early hours of the morning and I felt completely helpless, unable to deal with my conflicted relationship with my heart and my body. And in that moment, I really didn't know what else to do and who I could turn to for support. And I seriously considered ending my own life. And once again, the familiar darkness and peace that I experienced during my earlier NDEs, it enveloped me. And something happened that had not happened previously in the sense that my heart began speaking to me. And not in the sense that I'm now speaking here, but that a profound intuitive sense that my heart was speaking urgently to me. And that in order to survive and live well into the future, I needed to listen to pay attention and I would call this a transformative moment that broke through into my awareness at a time of deep emotional conflict and ill health and it offered me a choice between life and death and whilst it denied any kind of appropriate explanation through uh, the empirical lens that I tried to apply to it um, I discovered through my researches um, support in religious philosophy, in esoteric philosophy, and particularly with regards to uh, Professor Jeffrey Kripal, who you can see on the right hand side of my screen here, who talks about these impossible experiences that he calls that night in his own framework. Um, and Kripal, when he had his own that night uh, mystical experience, said that he initiated, it initiated a quest in his own life to um, discover what that meant, how that meant, gave meaning in his own life. So my that night 
was a catalyst that led me to reconsider my heart in many different ways. And I searched for frameworks and ideas to open the possibility for me to reach beyond the place that my knowledge at that time allowed me to perceive. So I was then led to, by my heart, um, I really understood over the years, it's been my heart constantly guiding me, that I discovered discourses, narratives that offered me helpful, supportive insights to build up into intellectual frameworks to understand. And this new knowledge set the foundation for my PhD research. And so you could say that really that these NDEs, my speaking heart, they it claimed me um, uh, and transformative learning and depth psychological terms, um, we could say that, um, like Rosemary Anderson says, a transformative learning theorist, that the research is chasing us, it's pursuing us. And as researchers, we're called from the culture at large that's seeking a change. Perhaps the heart is speaking out in all of our lives, in our culture right now, seeking a change, calling us back. And so I certainly can resonate with this idea within transformative learning that our research very often is claiming us um, and willing us to go deeper, um, to move deeper into what is um, speaking to us. So um, as part of my doctoral research, I explored the ways that the heart's been understood and engaged with by cultures in numerous different ways across history from being the seat of wisdom and intellect to the place of conscience and mind, and also the place associated with, one, with one's spiritual identity. And while today it's mostly understood through a medical science framework, it doesn't mean to say that any of the other hearts that I've talked about previously have disappeared. Um, very often they have much to say. Um, and as in my own story that I'm sharing with you here today, they do have a lot to say. And once I began to turn towards my heart and listen to my heart's guidance, I was taken on an incredible journey of learning and discovery. Um, and so really, what if we took on board the possibility that if other hearts live within us um, and that they've been silenced, how might they draw attention uh, today to themselves? And it's a really important question that I've sat with for many years. And I have a deep understanding that my heart through my NDEs was calling me back to its wisdom and guidance. And my work today is supporting others to reconnect to the wisdom and guidance of their own hearts. So really just to sum up, because I know I don't have a lot of time, um, but really from my own perspective, you know, committing to move into the experiences, the teachings of my NDEs and to listen to my heart story through its language of the imagination. It's expanded my understanding of the heart and given me access to a rich and complex, mysterious world that's often not available through a contemporary reductive lens that's often applied to these experiences. And so this different way of seeing has opened up a deeply compassionate and loving, non-judgmental heart that guides my life each and every day. And I've now met 11 different hearts um, on my journey, uh, each with their own wisdom and guidance. And I have a daily practice of sinking into my heart space and asking what my heart or a particular heart wants me to know. So through my NDEs and the teachings of my heart, the way that I see the world has changed and my relationships with myself, you thank wonder. you, and my heart and others have all been transformed. So um, basically, I would just leave you with a question um, as I as I finish up now and just say, speaking heart, you know, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to teach me? Um, and so if you'd like to find out more about my research, my journey, my work, uh, you can find out more via my website, heartsenseresearch.co.uk. But it's just been a real pleasure to be here with you today um, and to share um, my experience with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Louise. That was def definitely fascinating. And I'll let you know later on why, because of the heart. Okay, so now we have Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards. Uh, She's an near-death experiencer who has lived a purpose drive life of service. She is a founder and director of the program, Your Life and Certified NLP Life Coach. Dr. Edwards is also recognized as expert at merging spiritual 
principles into clinical practice in 1999, her work in prison, rehabilitation, and community reentry earned her Lionel West Leadership Award under the mighty name of Jennings. So welcome, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Norma. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a, a privilege and a joy to be here with you today to share, not only to share my experience, but to learn also from the experiences of others. I am Norma. That is the way I signed my name after a phenomenal awakening from a near death experience. I uncovered the fact that when we put I am before our first name, what we are doing is affirming the divinity that we carry. And that begins to take us to that very, very loving place of the heart. I was born in Guyana, South America. Uh, traveled, got married and traveled to London where I had my near death experience in the 60s. And it was a medical emergency that took me there. And I ended up at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. And uh, they had to uh, take me into the operating room so that they can um, work on the problem that I was experiencing. While there, I found myself free of the pain that, that took me to the hospital. And I found myself on the ceiling looking down at um, the nurses and the doctors as they performed um, the process they needed to perform. From there, I found myself moving through the ceiling and into a very, very, very dark tunnel. But I have to tell you, there was no fear, absolutely no fear. I emerged from the tunnel into crystal clear white light. And in so doing, what I experienced was that I had become love. But that the light that I merged with kind of spoke to me as the love, the love that embraced me, not only while I was on earth, but continually while I was in the spirit world. From there, I found myself drawn to a screen where I reviewed the 26 years of my life that I had just left. And um, what was very interesting was that the way I found discovered that the way I had planned my life was not the way I lived it at all. And probably the reason why I ended up in the dilemma that I ended up in. When the screen came to an end, I had a question, a religious question that had bothered me all of my life. And that was, what did Christ mean when he said, I came to give you life so that you may have it abundantly? And it seemed that all the pastors I asked and wisdom keepers, nobody could answer that question. So the question popped back up into my mind. And with so doing, it took me to the Akashic Record. The Akashic Record is the place where the records of, of earth and every human being is, is displayed. And while I was there, I was taken to six other incarnations, each of which included a, a very frightening or very um, dark experience. And I experienced the, the lifetimes complete with the emotions, et cetera. And then I found myself moving to a river where I met what I call the family. There were hundreds of souls there, some of whom I recognized because I had lived with them in my 26 years of life on earth. But most of them were from these other lifetimes that I had reviewed, but I could feel the love and the, the love that they brought to me. And I wanna say here that for all of us near that experiencers, there is no language that can really describe the joy, the love, the feeling of bliss, the fact that we are home, we are excited to be home, and we are very comfortable, very comfortable and nourished in that environment. While I was visiting family, again, I experienced this phenomenal love, and then I was told by one of my family members that they were sending me back with a message. And that message was, there is more to life than meets the eye. 
Now, I was not a happy camper. And I asked whether they could not identify someone who was living on earth and give them the message rather than send me back. But that didn't get me out of, that did not get me out of the need to return. But what I really want to share with you today is upon my returning back into my body, I felt like I was slammed into my body, excruciating pain. And all the experiences of life here on earth, which includes pain, I seem to feel that. But then I woke up to the fact that my consciousness had been completely changed. When I woke up that morning, I had certain belief systems. And all of a sudden now I'm sitting in, in, in a little, I'm lying on a bed in a recovery room and there are two nurses who are sitting there, I guess, paying attention to my vital signs. And they're having a conversation about the sermon at church the day before, which was a Sunday. And the sermon included hell. And I'm outraged. I'm absolutely outraged. How could that come out of the mouth of a pastor? There is no such thing as hell when it says God is, is unconditional. He is. But I couldn't speak because I've got, I've got tubes in my throat. When they were finished, they turned on a little radio. And classical music began to emit from the radio. Now I can see the color of the notes. Every note has a color. Every color is attached to a number. Every number is attached to a mathematical symbol. And I'm watching these two nurses absorbing the energy that is being emitted from the music that they're listening to. And I'm absolutely fascinated. And I begin to realize that music has some amazing properties. And that if we learn how to breathe the way we should, we can actually heal our bodies and heal others using the rhythmic sounds of music. But the oneness that I talk about, I talk about us opening up to oneness, really got explored and opened to me the day I left the hospital. I stepped out of the hospital and I can see the trees. It was winter. There were no leaves on the tree, but I could see the energy descending from the branches into the earth and the energy from the, 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 the roots traveling up and emitting its energy into the world. And I was absolutely fascinated. At that moment, I began to recognize and acknowledge that we are all one. Whether we find ourselves in the animal kingdom, in the human kingdom, in the spiritual kingdom, in the kingdom of the trees and nature, I felt, I experienced that oneness, that we are never alone, and that life is a fully vibrating feel of rhythmic energy that we are absorbing and can learn, can be taught how to interact and work with that rhythm. It led me to pursue a lifelong journey to find what my purpose here on earth, my full purpose here on earth was. I wrote a book, Awakening, which um, I, would, I would recommend to read because it would give a whole lot of information on the journey that I undertook and finally found my life's purpose and enter prisons in the United States of America because by then I lived here. I entered prisons in the United States of America and used what I had been given upon my return to help prisoners and, and people who are incarcerated to heal and to transform their lives. It has been an extremely interesting um, life but the thing I want to stress the most is that humanity, like the earth, is moving towards the next level of our expansion. And I feel that near death experiencers and people who have had spiritually transformative experiences have been allowed to do that so we become the nucleus of helping to transform the world and the consciousness here. And so if, if I want, one of the things I really want you to remember about this, 
this little talk that I'm giving here, is that whether we recognize it or not, there is a oneness of the universe. We're tied, our energy is tied to the stars, it's tied to the earth, it's tied to the planets, it's tied to our hearts, it's tied to each other. And once we experience the awakening, we can begin to feel that experience of oneness. And I believe that that is the curve that will take us, that will take us to becoming and acknowledging that we are all one here as we walk on the planet. I'd like to leave with you this statement that was given to me after about three years of downloads. I've experienced three years of downloads, which has given me the opportunity to be able to transform lives. And it is this, love is divine. God, the creator, is love. And love, when it enters the planet, turns into light. And light is the store of creation. And as we increase the numbers of human beings who have experienced near death and who have experienced transformative experiences, we are, in fact, brightening the earth. We're expanding that, and I am firmly of the belief that we, the near dead experiencers and the spiritually transforming people, we have the responsibility to go ahead and help others to expand their light and their consciousness with or without a near dead experience. And I do believe that that is possible because I have experienced it. I'd like to share one for a point. Crossing the veil, crossing the veil is a paradigm shift. That's what I call it. It shifts one out of the level of consciousness that you're carrying and it takes you to another level. When we cross the veil, we have arrived home. Now, different people will call it different things. You've arrived home because life is eternal. We never die. Coming to earth is like coming on a trip. And we come on a trip and we have an itinerary and we meet the requirements of our itinerary and then we go home. But the soul never dies. Meeting and greeting family on the other side was one of the most phenomenal and awesome experiences that I have had. And in my journey since then, I have been able to communicate and talk and relate and been taught by many of those with whom I've walked before. I give this to you in the full knowledge of knowing that this conference is about expanding consciousness. This conference is about helping us to get to oneness. And I really do believe that we have the capacity, those of us who have had the experience to teach and to share and to show others and to guide them back to their full spiritual nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Noma. That was just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful awareness. So you, you really touched me very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, now we have Don Hose, and Don Hose is an author and motivational speaker from Baltimore, Maryland. Don graduated from computer electronic schools in 1979. He has practiced medication for 50 years and is the author of Higher Consciousness Through Meditation, The New Golden Age of Love. Don's early spiritual experiences led him to a lifetime of, of spreading light and love that is a valuable, that's valuable to all of us. His spiritual perspective comes from a traditional and contemporary Eastern philosophy and the wisdom of the great saints and mystical with some Western flavor. Please, Don Hose, thank you very much for being here. Hello, everyone. Okay. Well, I would like to uh, share is basically on the what I've learned. I started to meditate at the age of about 13. Um, I'd had 
one near-death experience when I was 11. I fell into um, a very small pond. I had ice on it, and it doesn't take much for um, an 80 or 90-year-old child jumping up and down on that ice that was probably thin to go through it. So it frightened me probably more than anything else, the shock of the uh, cold water. Um, however, I, I just would like to share that experience, uh, a few things about that experience at 10 to 11 years old. Uh, obviously, if there was ice on that pond, I was, uh, my body was very cold. I was underwater. Uh, I don't even know if I went unconscious or not, but all of a sudden I began to feel warm, very warm. And I'm thinking to myself, if it's wintertime and it's cold, how am I feeling warm? And so I realized that I was no longer inside that physical body to feel the physical elements. And so I encountered a, a pinkish white light that went from light to being a radiant light. And I don't remember how I got out of that water. Um, like I said, I don't even remember at that age whether I went unconscious or not. I think the thing that baffled me the most was I didn't feel cold. And all of a sudden, I did feel cold. And then that's when I came back into my body. So it was a brief experience that I had but the fascinating thing was I didn't feel cold. I felt warm when I shouldn't have. And I experienced a, a radiant pinkish white light. I didn't think about that anymore for a couple of years. Uh, I was raised an Episcopalian in the Christian church and we had a book table at my church. And I found a three by five card one day on that table and the card said, if you Meditate on me for five minutes a day, a minutes a day, your life will change. And there was a very statuesque, uh, beautiful photo of Christ on that card. And the artist or the picture taker made the eyes look very beautiful and large. <laughs> so I'm having this picture of Christ staring at me. And at the same time, I'm hearing, if you meditate on me for five minutes a day, your life will change. Okay, well, guess what? I didn't know what the word meditation meant. So I went to the library and I found two books only in 19, in the early 70s, I believe. Um, one of them was called Om. And there was an Indian or Eastern gentleman in there showing all these postures he looked like a pretzel. He could do all these amazing physical things with his body. And I realized that that's not what I was looking for. I later found out that was Hatha yoga and there's prana yoga and all these different yogas. So long story short, uh, I did find out uh, in the back of his book, there was a page. It said you can meditate in two positions, that your center of meditation should be in between the two eyes, eyebrows, over the bridge of the nose, which is uh, if you went inside about an inch and a quarter would be the location of what people call the third eye, the Shiv Netra, the mystic eye, the single eye. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Well, that fascinated me because I wanted to be, I wanted to experience this light that I was reading about. And I had that one experience where I had experienced that pinkish white light. He simply said, if you sit still, be still and know that I am God, Psalms 4610, uh, that you experience the light of God. And the, the, where I was supposed to focus was right here. So I began to do that. The first time I was able to do that lasted for about seven minutes. Every morning now, I get up and I go into the temple. The body is the true temple of God. I've had friends ask me, why don't you go to church? If you believe in all this stuff and you're into Christ and everything, you don't go to church. I said, well, you know, I go to church every day. I enter the temple of God, which is the human body. 
and I have the experience of light and vibration or sound, and that ascends, that ascends me. So I began the meditation. Uh, within a year or so, I began to experience light. Uh, the light got brighter. I began to have more experiences, and by the age of 16, the out-of-body experiences were daily. Um, and I learned that, um, that, you know, by sheer will, of course, this would be with the grace of the creator, nothing we think we do, we think we're the doer. And I'm here to tell you, we don't, we're not the doer. And we don't find the creator, the creator finds us when we're ready. The creator helps to make us ready, and then we can have union on some level, which is called communion. Communion is where two or more gather in my name, there I am in their presence. So, you know, I went on with my meditation practice, which I've been doing now for 54 years. I've never missed uh, getting my daily bread. You know, the bread and wine is the, is the light. The bread is the light. And the wine and water is the current. There's a current there. It's called the audible life stream. You can, you can look it up. Audible life stream or sound current. And ever since I was about five years old, I used to go to bed at night or turn the TV off, and I'd hear this high-pitched ringing, which the doctors want to tell you it's tinnitus. Not everybody has tinnitus. Tinnitus is a physical uh, damage to the nerves. If you put that aside, there's a constant hum or a ringing or church bell, a seashell. It sounds like a seashell for some people. Some people hear the last trumpet, they hear trumpets or the harps. And believe it or not, all this is in our, every world scripture talks about this sound current. They talk about the music, the sound that we can hear with our inner ear, just like we have an inner eye third eye, we have an inner ear. So the inner ear is designed for us to hear the voice of the creator. The inner eye is designed for us to see the light. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of the word astral. I've heard a lot of people talk about astral projection. All I can tell you is that if we practice enough here, placing the attention here, if not I be single, it's a promise, your whole body shall be full of light. We see light and the light only gets brighter and the sound only increases in intensity until they both become audible and we can understand what's being done and what's being shared with us. So uh, make a long story short, you don't meditate for 54 years if nothing's happening. <laughs> uh, we're here to learn how to love uh, you, we have two purposes. Everybody has a worldly purpose. Some people become an author, a doctor, a lawyer. You have to find that purpose. And I'm, I'm sad for people that reach 90 or, and never find out what their earthly purpose is. But believe it or not, we all have the same spiritual purpose. We are to unite with the creator. It's that simple. And there are names that I could run through, Kabir, Jalaluddin Rumi, Shamsi Tabriz, Muhammad, Buddha, uh, Namdev, Ramanan, Gobind Singh, uh, Moses. Moses had the same out-of-body experience, whether it was uh, near death or not, doesn't matter. He saw a burning bush. And when he got to the, we got to the bush, there was no fire. There was no heat. And that's because he, his experience had nothing to do with the physical. It wasn't a physical experience. If people don't know what I'm, what I'm talking about, they have to make it about the physical because they're not aware that there are laws that transcend the physical world. There is no way that the, in, when we go within, for example, the light and the dark are not equal. Light has always overpowered the negative forces. So once we make a strong enough connection with the light within and begin to have experiences on a regular basis inside, then the negative forces have no power over us at all. 
They only have power as long as we're in the, in, the, in the mindset of the world and have fear and anger and ego. And those energies tend to dominate our planet right now. And this is why the earth and we are going through all the different changes that we're going through. We're trying to get into a new age. The new age isn't something that's coming. It's been here. It's already started. And, you know, if you look at schools of fish or you look at animals that travel in, um, you know, units or families or you see birds flocking, you always see one out front of everybody. We use birds, for example. You see one duck, that one duck is out. And when it gets tired, it falls back and another one takes over. So they all have a place in the formation of wherever they're going and but they all tend to have be going in the same direction but not everybody arrives at the same time why am i sharing that that's because we're all at different levels of consciousness we all are going to arrive at a different time in this thing but we can have love amongst us uh, we can basically do this and avoid the negativity of politics and all that stuff that's going on right now um, I even had, uh, later in life, I, I would like to share this quickly. I had a gun pulled on me and I saw my life before me, uh, bleeding out on the floor. So I saw what would have happened had that person pulled the trigger. What I had to do was not allow that to happen. In other words, not play into their anger their ego and their upset with me. At that moment, all I could do was love this person. And I'm telling you, and I'm sure Norma Edwards and everybody here knows what I'm talking about. The power of love is probably the greatest power that we have. And everybody has this within us, but everybody's at a different phase of having contact with that power. It's just not something that I can say, oh, I'll get in contact with it tomorrow and it's done. Like It's never that easy. We have to work. And just like we have jobs and work to do on the physical level, there's spiritual work. Um, I don't want to run out of time. I know I'm going fast. Um, I would like to give you what I believe is the spiritual meaning of tithing. You know, like I said, when... When people lost the ability, you know, ages ago, everybody had the eye open. This third eye stayed open and we could go in and go up whenever we wanted to. And by the way, there are many realms. It's just not you cross over to the astral plane and that's it. And you're in heaven. That's just one substrata of the, of, of the heavens. You know, it said there are many mansions in the house of my father. Man, there are many planes or realms in creation. No, we have one minute. One minute. Okay. So my teacher says there's eight realms. And so there's a process for us in this ascension thing. Near-death experiences are involuntary. The person has no control over what happens to bring about the experience. And OBEs are voluntary. There's something that I sit down and it happens. What I found out was that the experience of light inside, the, the spiritual aspect of it is the same. How we get there is different, but the outcome is the same for everyone that wants that. So I spend a lot of time having these talks with people and sharing with them. And um, last thing I wanted to say, I heard a Dr. Lawrence, I believe earlier, people asked him, was a teacher necessary? And I just wanted to validate what he said. He said, yes, having a spiritual teacher is very important in the process. Um, and I just wanted to share that. So it's hard to put a book into a nutshell, but I did the best I could. <laughs> Hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much. I really enjoyed it very much. It's, it's enlightening, everything you share today, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the, our last speaker in this panel is Lewis Brown, Greek. He grew up in the trapping of privileges, but felt called to work and serve in a field of diversity consciousness after having had a near death experience and coming back to do the work 
I was meant to do in this lifetime. So instead of racing through the ranks of industry or politics, Lewis chose to dedicate his professional life to teaching straight white men like myself who don't get into how to get it. So for decades, he has also been teaching and facilitating San Francisco Bay Area IANS groups after having recovered from three near death experiences. That was welcome and glad to have you here. Go ahead. Thank you. You know what I love best about being here is listening to everyone's story and the details of all of our unique stories aren't as fascinating to me as the reality that whatever body we're in in this lifetime and whatever cultural, social, therefore life experiences and doorways through which we enter are, as different as they all are, we end up learning mostly the same truths, you know? And so what I want to share with you is not the details of my, of the physical story of how I left my body, you know, that can be one sentence each, but, but the learnings that I needed to become more conscious and one um, are, are on one hand, just mine, the ones I needed to, and yet uh, might be some of the ones that each of you have also had. And that, that's what I enjoy about this. So, the first one in March 11, 77, here in Berkeley, California, near San Francisco, was that I totaled my automobile. Um, and every time I go past that intersection now, there's a stop sign that never was there until my accident <laughs> required it to be made. But that's the one sentence, I totaled my car. And my experience was that I suddenly was called high speed through what we call the tunnel uh, into absolutely pure light. Uh, and, and as has been said, words aren't enough, but I was in the source of all light, all love, all consciousness, all knowledge. It doesn't mean I had all knowledge. I was in the source of all of it and the source from which we all came and to which we all return. And thereby, I discovered our oneness immediately. And simultaneously, that since I know here on earth, we are in each of us the unique body with the only DNA that's ever existed in the history of life on earth, immediately I was cured of all my normal human um, tribal bias, ignorance, ethnocentrism, uh, which I have and many of us have, um, just by the recognition that we're all one and uniquely different in these bodies. Whereas in prior lives, which I then began to recognize were also true, we weren't in these bodies. I mean, I just, that's, that's almost what I love most, but listening to each person. And instead of imagining whatever we imagine because of how they look, how each of us looks, our melanin, our gender, our every aspect of us, it's part of our life here on earth this time. And it's not our soul and it's not our oneness. Um, so being just like that, I was given consciousness I had never had, being raised in all white and very privileged in North America, um, and therefore 100% ethnocentric and limited to only my own language, you know? And what I discovered was that everybody else that I met that wasn't like me had had to do the bridging that that crossed our differences in order to relate, whether it was language or other ways we communicate. And so when in the light, I was asked by a voice that some people call a conversation with God, what is it, Lewis, that keeps you from being all you're capable of being? Not doing, because I was able to do mostly whatever I wanted. But this voice that said, 
I want you to know you're called here to have this conversation and sent back. But what is it that keeps you from being all you're capable of being enabled me to go more deeply than I had ever needed to, to discover what I just shared with you, that my weakness that kept me from being all I'm capable of being was that I didn't have a clue how to relate to one another outside of, uh, given all of our differences and everybody else had had to learn to do it. And so I got the answer. There it is, Lewis, there's your work. And I was sent back down and doors started to open. I had nothing to do with. That was my first real learning here on earth. Wow, that means every door that opens is I'm called in by the source to experience what I can learn and how I can serve and use whatever privilege I and all of us have just to serve, okay, in our oneness and in our love of one another and, and to help heal whatever ways we're not able to relate to each other and with true equity and true belonging and true oneness. So my global wife and I started the first diversity training in the country in the early 80s. And I've been doing that for 40 years, hoping that white men like myself would become attracted to it. And with all of our videos, 23 different videos, workshops, seminars, etc. Sure, we made progress. But as uh, Malcolm X once said, yeah, we made progress. The knife was once a foot deep, and now it's only six inches deep. Whew. And this is true worldwide. Look at the gaps we have. So that was my first near-death experience. And for 20 years, that was my successful serving. Well, then in the second one, these, these, I love sharing them as if, wow, they're my greatest life's learnings. Instead of telling you, woe is me, I had these three crises. Oh, the second one was statistically even more impossible than a totally in an automobile. I took my 15-year-old daughter and 10-year-old son on a whitewater river trip in Montana, and a 100-foot tall tree fell off the edge of the river and landed on my head and fractured the skull. And I was dead, they thought, in the raft. And when they discovered, after they took the tree off of my head that was totally fractured, with blood everywhere, I was alive, but I was talking just gobbledygook because the brain was so damaged. And... I even find this interesting that what was damaged was mostly the left frontal lobe, which was the aspect of my education and privilege that had enabled me, driven by the spirit from the first white light experience, to serve in all the ways I had served, raising consciousness of all of our oneness and our human uniqueness and how to value our diversity as gifts to one another. And so... Why was it that the whole left frontal lobe that had been used to enable me to do all the things that I was able to do to help create this increased consciousness, why was that being removed effectively by such serious damage that it resulted after eight days in a coma of three years of hospitalized brain injury recovery? And here's why, or here's one of the gifts. Literally in the first week, I couldn't read, write, walk, or talk. I didn't know who I was, who my children were, my parents, who these strangers were in the room. I knew and could remember nothing. So I had to do in these three years a recovery, a rebuilding, a brain plasticity of enabling new synapses to be created, to find the data already there, and or to relearn some things. And I, it's just astounding to me that here I am, you know, 95 to 100% back. And at other times, 100 to 110% back, as you all know from whatever crises you've had in your lives, which led to your greatest learnings. It's amazing. And yet the biggest learning came in this first week when I was trying to walk on those horizontal bars. I couldn't talk. I didn't know anything. And to use a metaphor, all metaphors are 
oversimplify, but they help. Use the metaphor of a tornado or a hurricane, whichever one you know better. And we all know that at the center is pure stillness. So I want you to know what I felt was I, I couldn't do anything or know anything. But you know what I got? At my center, my core, our center, our core, all of us is 100% light, love, spirit, and energy. Uh, and and uh, in all, all seven chakras, all fed from the light that just comes through the eighth chakra from above. You know, and our soul doesn't die, as has already been said. Um, all of the damage of our life experiences and all the trauma, yes, is in our life experiences and in our body. It, but the soul isn't damaged and doesn't die. The soul just gains wisdom from each of these learnings. So it just changed my life even more, as if discovering our oneness and our uniqueness hadn't been enough. Wow. Well... So then I spent 20 years learning to be a coach instead of just a speaker and a trainer and a facilitator. And a coach means, Lewis, shut up. You don't know the answers. You have to ask questions. And the answer is always in every client, right? And at the soul level, actually. Um, so that's what I've been doing for 20 years instead of running a company and, and reaching thousands. But my goal is still to help those of us, especially straight white males in North America, but you know, it's not caused by melanin. Ignorance is, and, and tribal bias is worldwide, whatever our melanin, whatever our race, whatever our culture, you know? Um, so we all have to go through whatever our own learnings are. Anyway, so I'm doing the same work, but I'm trying to do it more one-on-one -on -one and in smaller group facilitations. Well, listen to the next learning. 20 years more or 25 years more this time, uh, when COVID hit us all in, in early 2020, I was first diagnosed with stage three cancer that then created chemo and for six months. And in the sixth month of my chemo treatment, I caught COVID at the hospital for, from the nurse giving me my chemo treatment. And I got it so badly because that was the early stage when it was taking a thousand of us a day, you know, and within two weeks, I couldn't breathe and I had to be rushed to the hospital and they put me in ICU and they said, you're going to have to breathe this or this or this various ways of forcing air in, or we're going to have to put you in the ventilator. And I said, no, I'm not going in the ventilator. My first cousin just died after the ventilator or on the ventilator, and I, and I can't do that. And they said, well, they took me. Well, yeah, guess we what? Have I had, one minute. We have one minute left. Perfect. I had 10 days uh, out of body in various experiences, but to keep it short, the last two days during which they were telling my wife that uh, they may not bring me back because of heart failure in one night and a total lung collapse on the other night, I was up there, and this is a silly metaphor because there's no way to describe it, but picture you're hanging on a bar trying to do a pull-up, but you're not two feet above the ground. You're a million feet above the ground, and you have to hang on. I had to hang on every second, every second, just to live. And uh, luckily, I was able to, but every second for 48 hours, try that. And everyone else in ICU had died. And in my vision, in my outer body experience, I've experienced everyone go out of the three-dimensional spherical um, dome that I was a part of. And bam, on my birthday, on August 16th, um, I was brought back to life and in my body. And then it took a year to no longer need a oxygen machine and it took oh three months in bed not able to move my body because the muscles had all deteriorated so it was an amazing experience but what i got then in my closing statement was i have to come back not only to live and to love the love of my life and our children i have to come back after watching the knee on george's neck and all the other things we've watched 
to continue to work with any white male who's open to discovering the amazing gift we have of truly valuing all of our diversity and our uniqueness and our oneness uh, in true equity and inclusion and belonging, okay? And that's, that's who I am, that's what I do, and that's how I be. And now I'm on the board of a group called Conscious Leadership Guild, where we're those of us who've, who've done much during our life are learning to be before we do and to be more integrated ourselves that way and to value our oneness in all the ways we're different as gifts to one another. That's all. Thank, thank you. you. All thank of you, you for so your amazing. Much. Thank you all for your amazing thank stories. You. Thank you very much. Well, now we'll have some questions and answers. We've, we've been having a lot of chatting in the chat. Everybody is talking <laughs> about a lot of things. So we'll, I'll try to get a little bit of to everybody. So the first one is for Dr. Luis. They, they mentioned, somebody mentioned there that the human heart opened your spiritual heart in an amazing way. So uh, how do you think that this, that you can communicate with your heart after this beautiful experience you had, Dr. Luis? Oh gosh, that's that's such a big question. Um, I mean, this this journey has been a long journey, and my heart's been speaking to me for such a long time. So um, it's it's a really difficult one to answer because um, I've just been sinking in and listening. I'm trusting, moving into my heart, listening, trusting, um, learning the language that my heart speaks which hasn't been an overnight thing either. Um, but certainly, yes, the, the, the sort of question in the chat was that my physical heart and all the problems that I had with my physical heart opened me up to something deeply transformative, um, something other beyond the ordinary day to day. Um, and that is, it's, it's love. It's the energy of, of love and connection and harmony and togetherness um and i'm still learning i i see myself as an apprentice to my own heart and my heart's teachings so that's really what i wanted to kind of end with thank you that's beautiful beautiful answer thank you very much well now it's for dr norma you there were several comments one of them was that you were such a good speaker that's amazing so one of the questions i got privately is like how did the church take this receive this beautiful awakening you had so Reverend, how, how, how did you handle this in the church? How was it taken by the rest of the church members? <laughs> Not very well. Not very well, but I, um, I, have been, I have been made to, by my spiritual guides, I have been told that I have a duty, I have a service. And so I still, I am a Christian, I, I will continue to be that because when I went to the Akashic record, I discovered that I chose the symbol of the cross and the cup as the symbols that would guide this lifetime. And therefore to turn away from it would be not such a good idea in this lifetime. Because, you know, we live every single symbol. We live every single uh, part of it. But no, the, the church is not very open to this. And um it's kind of interesting. When I got frustrated, my very best friend said to me, Norma, you were not sent there to observe. You were sent there to be observed. And um, here and there, you know, you have a few people who are ready, but um, they're a long way from accepting. Very That's good. Okay, I'll get back to you with another question. Thank you very much. Now with Dawn. Don, uh, somebody asked, did you experience the phrase, love your enemy? Did you uh, yeah, can you repeat it one more time? Did you receive this phrase that's called love your enemy? Did you receive that phrase? No. Did you, did you experience it? Did you experience that phrase, like loving your enemy? That's one of the questions. Well, uh, I didn't experience uh anything like as an enemy i be i i think that i have been in the light of love enough though that i realized that the same love that's in me is in everyone 
So I tend to uh, turn my enemies into friends. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be back with you with another question too. Okay, and uh, uh, Lewis, the, uh, the question somebody asked, what's, what message would you give to, after everything you've, you've now shared with us, what message would you give to people that are suffering and struggling with, with whatever physical disease they're going through? What, what, uh, what message would you give them? Um, I, I only by sharing my own experience instead of being righteous enough to know what will happen to them, I know several things. One, if we die, of course, none of us have been out as afraid of dying. There is no pain the minute we leave. There's nothing but light and love, okay? Secondly, uh, recovery is possible. Statistically, that depends on lots of things, but it is possible no matter what we are going through. That doesn't mean it will happen. I just mean sometimes it is possible. And I know, because I've experienced it, that in addition to medicine, Western, Eastern, or whatever, and eating properly, and attitude, and spirit, and soul, that even just the desire to live instead of die, I've experienced because there are moments those many of us know when we can either let go or just insist on coming back. Just a choice sometimes, okay? And once we're back, I can tell you that the recovery process, if to the extent that it in, enhances our condition, okay, no matter how long it is, can be so positive as it was for me that every every... Every moment I improved, I felt more grateful. That doesn't mean I didn't feel terrible about all the things that weren't working, but they didn't. It's like I don't give them the keys to drive, if you will. The, 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 the gratitude for life and breathing, I who wasn't able to breathe, is amazing. Okay. And therefore, lastly, no matter what condition we're stuck with, if we are, I have many post-cancer and post-COVID side effects, and some of which will never go away. And we just learned to say, this is the way it is now, but I'm still alive and I'm breathing and I love and I see. And when I'm authentic, I can experience being seen. So the oneness that I've learned never leaves. Um, and the uniqueness never leaves as I just continue to want to see and hear each of you, everyone I meet, uh, and have that be the gift of life and love. Those are all the short answers that, that I can give that I hope are helpful to anybody going through anything other than their total health. Thanks. I'm sure they will. That's beautiful, beautiful answer. Thank you very much. Now. For Dr. Norma, uh, somebody asked, do you still see the, the energy that way, the way you saw it? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Very much so. And it's, it's so comforting. I, I now live in South Carolina and I'm very close to nature and I spend every day, I spend a certain amount of time in nature. And um, I'm just entertained by, by observing and seeing the interaction, the interactions between nature, uh, the aspects of the planet, our physical bodies and our senses. And I am just very, very blessed by that. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have another one for Dawn about uh, the tinnitus. So do you think meditation, can meditation help you change that impression you can, the negative part of tinnitus, like hearing music? So do you think meditation changed the way you see things? That's for Don. For Don. Yeah, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, I, I noticed changes in the first few months, in the first two years, big changes. So after 50 years, you become a different, species of human 
you, you know, you become more uh, godly and things don't trigger you uh, like they did at one time. Uh, you, your, your whole, it's all about, and I think Lewis was, was, was alluding to, look, if you, if you folk, you, we become what we place our precious attention on. So if we place our attention on love every day and maybe two or three hours a day in meditation, it has to build up in you like a river becomes the ocean and you become filled with this force of love. You know, somebody said, uh, practice love until you become love. And then you become a walking pitcher of love and you simply radiate or pour out this energy on everybody that comes in contact with you. Now, some people won't be receptive to it. Some people a little bit and some a lot of bit and, and a lot of children tend to pick up on this very quickly because they're they haven't had time to be here and get caught up in all this stupid activity that's going on right now, like the, the politics and everything that's happening right now. Small children see right through all of that and they just move forward. They don't get caught up in all this stuff. So I'm saying that meditation helps you focus and stay focused. And if you do that on love enough, you become love. And the, even the animals will sense it. I, you, you, everybody, people here have experienced going into people's houses and I bet they say this to you, Norma and Lewis. They say, wow, my dog or cat never usually goes up to certain people like that. But you, they just went right to you. And they, these animals, even fish, they can tell. They, they pick up the vibration of the love with you. And, and uh, so I'm suggesting, yes, it changes you. And the more, you know, we have all read and heard thoughts. We become what our thoughts are. So I decided to have my thought force or energy on God as much as possible. May I add something, please? Do Donald, thank you. And uh, Norma, too. I, another key learning I had, I want you all to just feel. And that is, since, since and if, and or if you believe in prior lives, and those of us who've been out and back have the experience they're true. And my current daughter was a prior life where we met and she chose me. But the key thing here is just feel that if you believe in prior lives and the soul never dies, that last lifetime or any other lifetime or next lifetime, we weren't in this body. And just notice how you can really, are, you're able to feel when you go, God, I wasn't in this body. You weren't in those bodies last time. So I'm not going to be biased by just whatever body you're in now. I'm going to, I'm going to see and love you as a soul, just as fully light as mine. And then we can learn about what we've learned in these very different bodies and life experiences. And it's, an, it's just <laughs> freeing. Okay. It is just freeing. That's all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I think that with that, you answered one of the last questions, which was that if you, uh, it says here, oh, I lost it. There's so many people talking here. Okay, so uh, at the end, are you happy that you came back or would you have rather have stayed in heaven? You okay, know what? For answering, I think you answered. Better. Everybody can answer, but I can tell you, I've had, I ran near death workshops for about 10 years and almost everybody who had to come back said, no, it was so amazing there. I, I know I had to, or I wish I didn't have to, or whatever. It's so perfect. And my answer is the opposite, which is ugh, the minute I leave again, I'm coming back right away because I love living and I love love and I live in light and I get to meet each of you and see your soul and spirit. I, I'm going to keep coming back. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this has been an amazing panel, Dr. Lewis. Dr. Norman, uh, Don, and Lewis, thank you very much for this time. Thank you all. Bye-bye.